All right, guys, uh, here we are, our AP Modern Review, keeping in the time frame, we're going back to 1200. So today we're going to do Mesoamerican. We're going to back up a little bit. I'm going to go through the Mayas real fast, just to kind of give some context to what's go going on. So what we have, well, we know that there's been a lot of cultural diffusion going on between Africa, Asia, and Europe for centuries. Once the earlier paleo nomads migrated across the Bering Strait and got to the Americas, all right, when the Bering Strait melts, the land bridge between what is today Alaska and Russia, North and South America are cut off from cultural diffusion. The great cultures we're going to talk about, the Mayas, the Aztecs, the Incas, even the mighty Navajo and like Iroquois leagues, are going to do great things but they're going to be a little bit behind everybody else simply because they did not have access to diffusion. They also have no large beasts of burden, no horses, no oxen, no camels, and they did not develop the wheel. So everything has got to be done by pure manual human labor. And so when we start talking about the Mayas, we've got to talk about the impact of geography. If you imagine Mexico is like an arm flexing, um, the Mayan area, the Yucatan Peninsula, is the fist way, way out here. If you've been on a cruise, a lot of the cruises are going to stop there. And here in the Mayan kingdoms, we're going to have several different powerful cities. Think of like the ancient Greek city states, but instead of like Athens and Corinth and Sparta. We have um, Tikal, we have Polonique, we have um, Chichen Itza, we have Tulum, um, places like that. And this area is going to be a combination of, you know, lowlands, good for farming, thick, intense jungle that has, you know, engulfed the cities, if you can see atop of some of the big pyramidal structures right here. And it stretches from Mexico down into El Salvador, kind of into um, Central America there. Now... Each of the Mayan city-states here in this nice, like, um, you know, uh, shade of green, I guess, uh, jade green, um, are going to feature a couple different things. Number one, they had pyramids, pyramidal monumental architecture. They're not as big as the pyramids of Egypt, but they're a little steeper. They also have temples to two primary gods, the sun and the moon. Plentiful in Mesoamerica is going to be a lot of gold and a little bit of silver. So they're always decorated in gold and silver and palaces in stone carvings. And in these Mayan cities, we see the early rulers, just like the pharaohs of Egypt and, and the other god kings of the river valley civilizations, the kings were viewed as living gods, living representations of God um, on earth. And in the middle of every city, um, you come to a plaza or a square. On one side are the main religious temples. On the other side are the governmental buildings. And so these early people were um, polytheistic. Now we know that these early city-states were, were linked through alliances, um, trading. Sometimes they went to war with each other um, over like farming land or water rights when, when there was um, droughts. But we know that they did sometimes work through alliance, and they did trade a lot. Things like salt or flint, um, you know, cotton, honey, everything that they could find that was valuable. If you didn't have it, somebody else um, did. And as a result, they didn't have a uniform currency. Um, sometimes they use like, you know, cocoa beans. That would always be like a, a fun thing to do. Um, or other beans to, um, to make chocolate. But contributions to the world are going to be important. The crops of beans and corn maize, high in protein that you can prepare many different ways so you're not eating the same thing every day, are going to be exports and transatlantic trade to the world. So corn, beans, and squash, tomatoes, sweet potatoes, things of that nature. And so here we have the temple um, of the sun in Tikal. It's this very big giant building. You can see it's kind of steep here in the ancient city of Tikal, and it's 212 feet high. It's not as wide 
as the Great Pyramids, the Big Three on the Giza Plain, and it's only a little less, you know, it's not even quite half as tall as the Great Pyramid, um, but it's very steep, and it's still the height of a 21-story building, so it is very significant, but remember, no beast of burden, all right, no wheel, all of this was done by pure human labor. And the point of them, here's another one in Palanique, as you come up the steep stones, you come into this doorway and you find this stone slab. One of the hallmarks of especially the Mayas and the Aztecs is going to be human sacrifice. Blood sacrifices to please um, the gods. Now in the Mayas, sometimes you didn't have to die, it was just bloodletting. And sometimes nobles would do it because they felt that their blood was more important. But every now and then, you would be sacrificed. You can kind of see the, the dark red spots here on the table. You'd be sacrificed on this table when it would fill up with blood. It would be tipped down to the bottom to placate the gods, and the body would then be taken and disposed of. Um, the biggest one here is in um, Chichen Itza, the biggest and the most impressive. You can see it's kind of a step pyramid, kind of like an old um, a ziggurat here in Chichen Itza. And in Chichen Itza is the greatest example of, a, of the ritualistic ball game that is prevalent in all of these societies. It's combination soccer, football, rugby, ho hockey, and basketball, where your goal was to kick a ball or get a ball through this inverted stone hoop, kind of like a basketball hoop turned on its side. You could kick it, you could head it, you could knee it, you could do whatever, but you couldn't throw it. And while you were playing, if you wanted to hockey check somebody into one of the sidelines or really, you know, just gang up and really, you know, hammer um, uh, the ball carrier, you could. There were virtually um, no rules. The high priest would sit up in one um, press box. On the other side, the king would, and they had a carved satellite dish that you could speak into. If you're my students and you've gone to the Durham Museum of Life and Science when you were a kid on the... Uh, Second floor where they have all the, um, like, you know, space stuff, spacecraft. Um, you can kind of do that. It's the old satellite dish um, reflecting. And this was a game where two hero twins um, were very good at it. And they understood that the gods of good and light were constantly combating evil and darkness. And the um, combat between the light gods and the dark gods was this ball game. So the hero twins sacrificed themselves to go down to the underworld to help out the gods of good and justice. And they won. So one brother was resurrected um, as the moon. The other brother was resurrected as the star Venus, the morning and the evening star. And so once a year they would have their Super Bowl or their World Cup champion, and the winners would be sacrificed to go help out the um, hero twins and the gods of good and justice. It was their thing, and they um, looked forward to it. So I know I'm going fast here because I want to get to the Aztecs and, and the Incas. Society is as it is normally. You have you know, the, the high priest, um, and underneath him you've got the, high, the, or the king, who is the high priest. You've got other high priests, members of the royal family. Below that, you've got other powerful nobles, highly skilled artisans and merchants, and then the bulk of the population is the farmers and the commoners, um, peasants. Pretty much the same social structure that you see anywhere. And the Mayas um, be, um, were deeply polytheistic, you know, again, God of the wind, God of the sun, God of the rain, God of the moon. But they also believe that each individual day was a living God. And by looking at nature, you could predict the, the, the behavior. So in the wintertime, when things you know, were just cold and barren and nasty, the gods were sad and upset. In the spring, when you got a lot of violent thunderstorms and rain, the gods were angry, but kind of the you know, end of, of, of spring, going into summer, the gods are, are happy. And so they began to look at weather patterns and the change of the seasons and develop the famous um, calendar. Now, as we talked about earlier, the Mayas believed that they owed a blood debt 
to the gods in exchange for being created, right? how the gods um, created them. And so in addition to praying and offering different sacrifices, you know, food like corn, um, you know, flowers, um, they also offered noble blood and, and, and at times human sacrifices to nourish um, the God. And a lot of these um, places are, are, you know, at the cenotes, like at Chit Chitsen Itza, deep sinkholes in the, in, in, in the jungle, um, where the limestone was eroded by the water. Um, we've seen animals down in there, and some human bones, and like gold and jade and jewelry, different sacrifices to the gods, you know, the sacrificial pool theoretically going down into the Mayan um, underworld. Now the Mayas, like our guys Kevin and Leo, were really, really, really good at mathematics. And they were able to accurately um, calculate a year, about 365 and a quarter days. They even added in like a leap year. It's a, like we had this year. It's very, very, very eerily similar to our own. And most of their architecture, especially the pyramid at Chichen Itza, is based on the golden ratio, all right? 1 to 1.618, da 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 And if you look at the mathematical precision, it's the same thing that helped build the pyramids, the Parthenon of ancient Greece. It's even what Leonardo da Vinci used to put the smile in the exact center of the Mona Lisa before the Mona Lisa, as we talked about yesterday, was stolen in a bunch of times. So again, they did this without access to cultural diffusion. They do many of the same things, building pyramids, monumental architecture, complex math, but they did it on their own. And so the Mayas have two main calendars. All right, you have the, the 260 day religious calendar that is kind of based up you know, on the moon phases, or made up of 13 months and 20 days to each month. That is one ring. Then you have the 365 day solar calendar, and if you combine them, they form the infinity symbol or the um, figure eight. Now, instead of having 12 months like, like we do, the Mayan calendar had 18 months, but less number of days in them, about um, 20 days. Um, the calendar that freaked everybody out um, 8, 10 years ago, um, you know, you may recognize it. It is the face of the famous Pesos de Ocho, or Pieces of Eight, the one that, you know, the one good um, Pirates of the Caribbean movie that uh, Jack Sparrow um, was um, playing around with. They had five extra days left over at the end, so instead of having one day and night for New Year's, they have um, two of them. Now, problem with the Mayas is they did have an advanced writing system based on 800 glyphs, kind of like hieroglyphs from ancient Egypt. And they recorded all their important events on stone, on wood, even on paper. The problem is... The codex was destroyed um, when the mines begin to die out and as the Spanish conquistadors come. We only have a small piece of what I'm going to call the Mayan Rosetta Stone. So we are just beginning to decipher the Mayan language um, right now. So there's so much more to learn about them, like that young Canadian girl who found the city a couple years ago using satellite images, the, the, the new Mayan city. There's a whole lot more left to be learned about them. We just simply do not know it as of yet. And then in the early 800s, right around the time of the reign of you know, Charlemagne going through the um, Treaty of, of Verdun, the Mayan civilization begins to suddenly, mysteriously disappear. The cities were abandoned. Um, you know, the people moved, you know, we know some of them were still, very few were around when the Spanish came and they were killed by smallpox and the flu. We don't know what happened because we can't read um, the writing. So there's a bunch of theories. So there was an increased amount of, of warfare. There was an outside invasion, disruption um, to trade, economic hardship. We don't know. Maybe they had too big of a population boom and the, they couldn't feed um, themselves. So this leads to famine and possibly environmental disaster. We're not um, really sure. 
So by the time the Spanish arrive in the early 1500s, the Mayas were divided into very small, weak city-states that were very easily picked off, especially when the Spanish gave them smallpox-infested blankets and the flu, and they died um, very quickly. And that will give rise to one of the great hallmark civilizations of Mesoamerica, and that is the Aztecs, who are going to be more to the center of the country, modern-day Mexico City. And they're going to be prime time right in, in our timeline here in AP World Modern, 1200 to 1400 AD. And the Aztecs were kind of the warrior wing of another group known as the um, Toltecs. You kind of think of the Mamluks and, and Seljuk Turks doing the um, same thing. And whenever there was a problem, the Toltecs sent in the Aztecs to kick some Aztec. There's your great world history joke of the day. And then the Aztecs started scratching their head. Well, wait a minute. Why do we all always have to do the heavy lifting and the fighting for those guys? Why don't we defeat them and take over and we can run this show ourselves? And so that's how the Aztecs um, emerge. And they are what I'm going to call the Spartans of Mesoamerica. There was no standing um, volunteer army in the Aztec world. Every male was expected to participate in the army. The nobles were the officers and lieutenants, captains, majors, colonels, and generals. And the peasants were the frontline soldiers. And the more powerful the warrior you wore, the more elaborate your headdress and um, outfit was. And their goal was to capture surrounding territory. Here's their capital city, Tenochtitlan. And this green area is their conquered territory. But you can see they leave pockets of areas that are not conquered. And the Aztecs, when they went to war, they did not want to kill their opponents. They wanted to wound them. They had to bring them back as a sacrificial victim. No Mesoamerican state relied more on human sacrifice than the Aztecs. And then once you were conquered, the Aztecs were like ancient Rome. They were an extractive empire where they <laughs> stuck their straw into you and they sucked out your resources. Um, you know, here are some of the things that we've recorded that we can understand. One conquered civilization had to give 7,000 tons of corn to the Aztecs. Another one had to give 2 million cloaks. When you were conquered, you were beaten. They left you just enough to survive on. And your status as a soldier was measured on how many captives you brought back. The more captives you brought back, the higher your standing was. You could even change and increase your social class based on your fighting um, prowess. So that's how the Aztecs rolled. And they built one of the most beautiful, amazing capital cities in, in all of the world. Tenochtitlan is floating in the middle of Lake Texacoco. And it has, you know, one, two, three, you know, four or five causeways leading to it. And these two aqueducts bringing fresh water out, um, out of the mountains. If they were invaded, they could pop out these floating drawbridges and stay safe. They took woven reeds from the, the surrounding area, wove them together, kind of like a wicker, like strawberry picking basket, filled them with earth, earth, and then planted seeds in them. Like it was a, literally a floating garden as they anchored it to the floor of Lake um, Texacoco. So it was this beautiful, vibrant capital. So not only were the Aztecs tough soldiers, they were also excellent engineers building this floating lake, the causeways, the aqueducts, the um, chimpanas. And it's estimated that 60,000 people would go to the center market each day. You could walk there. A lot of people traveled by canoes. And think of like a giant Costco or a Sam's Club. 60,000 people, that's pretty much the size of our town here in, in Chapel Hill going to the market each day. It was incredible. Even Cortez is like, oh my god, this thing is awesome. City floating in a lake, covered in gold. It's even better than Venice. Now I'm going to go and destroy it. Well done there, um, Hernando. So, the religion 
as you can see, is based on human sacrifice. To the Aztecs, they believed the sun was in constant battle with his evil brother, which was night. Kind of like Set and Osiris from ancient Egypt. And the sun needed to power up his battery to recharge every day, to climb in the sky and do battle with night and darkness. The way to do that was to fill up with sacrificial blood. You know, I like to go back and be like, hey guys, for a little bit of the gold you've got laying around, I bet if we don't sacrifice anybody today, the sun will still come up tomorrow. But my flux capacitor is um, broken. So it's estimated as sacrificial victims were, were um, sacrificed every day during a major drought, there's a pretty good uh, Discovery Channel special about it. It's believed that um, 20 to 30,000 victims were um, sacrificed in one single day. It was just incredible. And they had different, not only sacrificial temples, but the Aztecs were brilliant on how they did this. They would go and attack a village and to capture all the young men, say, from like 35 to 15. They would leave everybody else alone, and they would not mess with that village for another 10, 12 to 15 years. By that time, all the young teenagers and boys had grown up, they had gotten married, they had produced other children, and then they would be reconquered. Um, the Aztecs couldn't conquer everybody because then they would run out of sacrificial victims that they had to fight in combat to capture. Um, their tools, just like the mines, were made out of flint or that hard volcanic glass known as obsidian, as they didn't have, you know, a strong metal. You know, they had gold and they had silver, but it's very soft and it's not good for weapons um, and tools. Now, as I said, uh, the Aztecs are kind of similar to the Spartans of Mesoamerica. The government is very strict. It is very authoritarian. It is military chain of command. I tell you what I want done, and you go and do it. There are only two main social classes. All right. Um, there are the um, officers. All right. General, Colonel, Major, Captain, you know, First Lieutenant, and Second Lieutenant, on down the line. And the nobles went to what I'm going to call officer candidate school. They literally went to, to be trained how to be an officer, but commoners could move up into that class if, if you want. But everything was color-coded. As I said, the more brilliant and red and purple and green and blue your costume was, um, connotated your place in society. The more vibrant and bright your colors, the higher up of an officer you were. And it was illegal to dress in a color outside of your social class. There was a tiny, tiny, tiny sliver of merchants and gold artisans that were very well um, respected. So here is an um, obsidian knife, uh, one of the Aztec temples in, in some artists' drawings and renderings, you know, um, ripping the heart out with the sun looking down based on some of what the Spanish conquistadors mm -hmm. drew up while they were um, doing it. And so while it was good to be an officer and you wear this colorful, vibrant, brilliant robe, very similar to other societies we are going to look at later on in absolutism, like Peter the Great and the great Ottoman Empire, and even daimyos under Tokugawa Iyasu, with great power comes responsibility. Nobles were always held to a higher standard of behavior than the commoners. It's like when you have your little brother and sister and your parents leave you in charge and something happens, your little brother or sister messes up, they don't yell at them, they yell at you and they say, well, you were supposed to know better. And to help things out, um, to organize things, again, very um, highly organized, um, Aztec taxation and equipment and keeping things clean and policed and garbage and recycling collected were divided into little things known as calpulis. And a calpuli is your neighborhood. Think of around, you know, the high school from, you know, Homestead Village to the um, yellow townhouses 
to the Highlands, to Camden Place, to Winmore, to Lake Hogan, to Wexford, to Williams Woods, to Cates Farm, down to Fair Oaks. Well, each of that's how you were divided, and your world was that little neighborhood. It's where you went to school. Um, it is where you grocery shopped. It is where your local um, temple was. Think of like you know big cities at the time of um, immigration. You come off the boat from Europe. There's the Polish neighborhood, the Jewish neighborhood, the Russian neighborhood, the Irish neighborhood, the Italian neighborhood, and that's where you went to church, where you went to school, where you grocery shopped. It's how it was done. Like my in-laws from Chicago, their territory was from like Western Avenue to like 105th Street, like, you know, a couple blocks. I'm like, my God, why do you go beyond that? And they're like, why? It's where they went to church, where they went to school, where they had their friends. It's just how it was. And so for the Aztecs, there were Capuli officials, kind of like the um, HOA people, if you live in my neighborhood, who've got nothing better to do than to measure the length of, of your grass. And they made sure that the houses were tidy, that the kids were being sent to school, both boys and girls. Taxes were collected. It was like competitive. Whoever had the cleanest neighborhood or when they were inspected or whoever paid their taxes first won um, an, a little prize. Again, it was military regimentation and um, organization. And women in the Aztec society unlike other societies, held a high status. Many women were allowed to um, speak in court. Many women could own and conduct their own businesses. Some were able to inherit property. And the more children you had, the higher your status was. The more soldiers you gave for the Aztec em Empire increased your social status. Right as the Aztec civilization reaches its high point around 1400, a little over 100 years later is when Hernando Cortez shows up in 1519. Um, and as he is at first befriended by the Aztecs, it quickly turns to war and all of those other civilizations that the Aztecs would beat up on every 10 and 12 years joined in with the Spanish to conquer the great Aztec um, Empire. Um, why, even though Cortez thought it was you know, awesome, he did not like the human sacrifice, so instead he massacres an entire civilization, destroys thousands of years of art and architecture and technology and science in the beautiful city of Tenochtitlan for the gold and because he um, wanted it. And this brings us we're leaving Mesoamerica, now we're going down into South America. We're going to talk about the West Coast coming from Argentina and Chile through Peru on up into a little bit of um, Ecuador. And the Incan Empire is going to kind of near the Aztec Empire in time frame from like 1200 going up into 1500 on a different continent. Now early on, the South Americans, um, the bedrock foundations were the Nazca and the Moche people, the people who left the big Nazca lines of like the spider monkey and the spider, and this is supposed to be a bird or something, um, I don't even know, but they left those Nazca lines and they left the foundation for what's going to be the largest empire in the Americas going from north to south in South America over 2,500 miles long. And much of the Incan Empire is located high up in the very rough, jagged Andes Mountains. The air is very thin. You have all these volcanic rocks, these young, jagged, like, you know, sawtooth mountains are up in there, and the people have to live in the valley. So it is a very difficult, difficult place. Here you can see the Aztecs believe that they came um, from Lake Titicaca on the border of Peru and um, uh, Bolivia. It's very gorgeous. Bolivia is kind of like you know, part of it. It's a giant salt flat um, uh, desert. But anyway, that is where the Incas um, are from. And by 1200s, the Incas had established themselves as a small kingdom in the valley of Cusco. And then some like barbarians were coming and attacking from the south, and the king fled. 
And the king's oldest son fled. Um, and, you know, as we start moving up into the 13, 1400s, and then the second son, kind of the spare, is a young guy named Patrick Cootie. And he says, well, my dad and brother ran away. I'm going to take advantage of this. And they go, well, God, these enemies are tough to defeat. Patrick Cootie goes up on this mountaintop, and there's this big, massive thunder and rainstorm, and everyone thinks he's dead. He comes down the next day, and he's like, woo, I'm jacked. I'm like Thor. Let's go. We're going to beat him. And they go into combat, and Patrick Cootie smashes into the enemy's king and runs them off and solidifies himself as King Patrick Cootie. Now his dad and his brother come back and try and bump him off the throne. People are like, uh-uh-uh, no way. Patrick Cootie now is like, you know, the, the Incan Thor, and he is going to take over. So Patrick Cootie um, solidifies his empire and begins to build his kingdom, his palace in Cuzco, which means the city of four quarters, as it runs along an eastern and a western and a northern and southern trade route. Well, Pachacuti begins to conquer, and as he does, he's got a pretty interesting method of conquest. Number one, he will go up to a new group and ask them um, to join his empire. If they would say no, he would build kind of like a, a warehouse and fill it with all the goods and clothing and textiles and food, and have the king or the chieftain walk through and say, as our gift to you, you can help yourself to anything. Now, don't you want to join somebody that is this powerful? And it, then, if they still said no, then they would be conquered. So it was more of a, an, an attempt at peaceful conquest than it was just straight out violent like the Aztecs. And if there were people who still resisted, say you lived in the hot rainforest jungle of the Amazon, um, Patrick Cootie would move you from the Amazon way up into the top of the mountains, and take mountain rebels and put them down in the river valley. You were disconnected from your source of comfort, and you would spend so much time trying to learn how to adapt to your new environment, you could not um, rebel. Now, as Patrick Cootie is expanding, he will go back and set up the laws that will run his civilization and turns conquest over to his son. And so by the time we get to the year 1500, the Incan Empire has about 16 million people. It is about 2,500 miles long from north um, to south. And again, the Incas only used force when necessary. They allowed you to keep your local leadership. They allowed you to keep your own local customs in exchange for loyalty. You had to acknowledge the Incan king as your king, pay taxes, and provide soldiers for the army, and everybody had to learn to speak and communicate in um, Incan. So anyway, one of the things that the Incans are going to do, I just kind of showed this, is I wanted to show you my pictures here of the Incan roadway network that runs through this jungle, kind of like a tunnel up these stone steps, and along this path, oh, I hope that guy doesn't fall off, along this path high up in um, the clouds. We're going to talk about that in one second. The Incan king and his nobles had complete control over um, all you know, legal, political, social, and economic aspects of life. He was a dominant, powerful monarch worshipped as a living god. And all subjects, even other Incas, had to pay into what is known as the Mita system. And the Mita system is simply where you didn't pay your taxes in, like, money. You paid them in labor. About a period of 30 to 40 days a year, you left your job and you went to help out the government. Right? Um, sometimes you help build the roadway system. Sometimes you help build a city. Um, sometimes you participate in, like, track and field or, like, um, wrestling um, um, tournaments. Maybe you help, you know, plow and, and sow food for one of the government um, crops. Anyway, you helped out on the public works projects. Once your, you know, month was up and, and it was, you know, this neighborhood is going in January, you're going in February, you're going in March. So you knew when it was coming, you went back to your job that you did the ele other 11 months of the year. And this system 
allows the Incas to build one of the greatest road networks in the entire world. Think of like the Roman roads throughout Europe. It's 14,000 miles. As I showed you, it kind of goes through, you know, carved steps into a mountain or a mountain ledge excavated off a 3,000 foot cliff to cross over. They've built these reinforced rope suspension bridges. Think of going up on Grandfather Mountain. If your dad's like me, he shakes the bridge all the time as you um, go across. This allowed the entire empire to be connected. It sped communication. It even had a little um, postal service. It facilitated trade. It allowed the army to move quickly from A to B. And they had a group of guys named Chodskis. These are our um, you know, cross-country runners, our um, um, you know, Abby and Anne-Marie and um, Lucy and uh, I can't remember all of our other cross-country runners. Um, you know, maybe Claude, I think. I can't remember. But anyway, um, they could, you know, they had a, a travel a distance, uh, they had little, like, you know, like dormitories, um, and they would have a little water bottle, a little basket of food, and this concord, and they had to run this route five to six miles with the message route, like an old Pony Express. When they got close, they would blow them a concord, and that would let the other person kind of stretch out and get ready and get ready to take the baton for the relay race. And you did this during the day, you did it at night, and so you had to really memorize that route in case there was bad weather so you didn't get lost or fall off. So much so that they could travel the entire road length in just five days with these runners going 24 um, hours a day. Now, much like the Mayans and the ancient kingdom of Axum, the Incas were masters at terraced farming. Because you can see over here how steep the mountains were, they couldn't grow crops there. They would all wash away. So the Incas carved these flat-like steps into a mountainside, cutting them down so as the water flowed down, um, they had a little irrigation canal here, um, there was flat area, so it would give the correct amount of water to the crops, but didn't wash them down the mountain. It was a way to maximize their food production in a tiny uh, mountainous area. Then they built kind of like this, you know, bathtub or kitchen sink drain. If anything did wash away, it would catch down here. An ingenious way to get um, all of this done. Again, it was all done on high altitude. Um, and one of the things that, that they herded was alpacas and llamas. Not so much for food, but for their wool to make warm clothing in, in the cold, high um, Andes Mountains. Now, the Incas are never going to develop a writing system. They are the one um, civilization in the Americas that does not. But their history and a lot of their literature was memorized in a rich oral um, a tradition passed down, you know, from generation, from grandma to, you know, son to um, grandson. But the Incans did create kind of their version of, uh, of an abacus known as a kipu. And a kipu is normally like, you know, gold or silver or, or copper hoop, and it has these different strings on it, kind of like a dream catcher. And it has different knots, you know, or a knot with a different colored bead. And what that was a way was to register numbers or communication, a way to record data. So if you had a green bead, and then you had a blue bead and a yellow bead, another blue, another yellow, another blue, another yellow, and then another green bead. Well, we think that green stood for earth, the sun was the, was, you know, the yellow was the sun, and blue was the water. So if there was a green, and then three blues, three yellows, and then another green, you traveled for three days over water. We're pretty sure that's what it means but we're not 100% as just like the Mayan Codex, the Master Rosetta Stone Kipu um, was lost. We think taken by the Spanish and then captured by the sea pirate Francis Drake to be sent back to England, but the ship carrying it never um, arrived. So, much like the Mayas and the Aztecs, 
on the most powerful god for the Incas was the sun god Inti. And the Incas believed, kind of like Japan, kind of like ancient Egypt, that their king was a descendant uh, of Inti, a, a son, an S-O-N, of the S-U-N. And so the Incas, instead of sacrificing a lot of people, would sacrifice food. And, and animals, and every now and then they would add in humans if they um, needed to. Um, but it was not as often, especially as the um, Aztecs. Now, just like ancient Egypt, the Incas practiced mummification, and a dead ruler is seen as a holy object, since he was an S-O-N of the S-U-N, and the Incas treated them as if they were still alive. They had an attendant who would bring them food, who would bring them water, they could still live in, in their house, they would talk to them. Um, every now and then they were taken out and placed next to each other so they could speak, and they were even taken to parades and festivals to either be part of the parade or sit down and view it. I don't know, man. Um, it was um, their thing. Um, the, big, the big temple, um, the not too much of it left right here, was in Cusco. Um, it was decorated in gold. It was known as the sweat of um, the sun. And then the pyramid of, of the moon was the um, tears of the moon, which was coated in silver. And as Francisco Pizarro rolls in there, he is shocked and astounded by it. Um, the most famous Incan city is probably Machu Picchu. That was just discovered 108 years ago in 1912, way high up in the Andes Mountains. We don't know if it was a religious center or if it was a retreat, kind of like a clubhouse for the emperor to go in and just get some um, quiet time, um, you know, built by Apache Cootie. We don't know. So here is the outer edge of Machu Picchu. Can see some of the terraces farming. Don't want to be the guy that you know falls off. And then the city built um, over here with this kind of you know little row of um, block houses and um, uh, town houses. It's about 11,000 feet high. It is a hike to um, get in there. It's very oxygen deprived. So it's great engineering. High up in this valley, you can see the river way, way, way many thousands of feet um, below. Um, just an intense piece of monumental um, architecture. Now, just like the Aztecs, just as the Incas reached their high point, you know, 1400s going into the 1500s, a civil war breaks out between the two brothers, Athlupa, who was the rightful heir, and his younger brother, Huscar. And the battle between the two really ravages the empire. Athlupa wins, and Huscar and his followers make off with, you know, gold, um, and then Athlupa is hanging tight, and then all of a sudden, a new enemy comes in. The Spanish and Francisco Pizarro. Cortez got the Aztecs in 1519. Well, you know, a little 10, 12 years later, uh, here comes, about 15 years later, here comes Francisco Pizarro in 1532. He's looking for gold. He doesn't find it. But he finds a lot of silver and will become the great Patesi silver mine. Like 80% of the world's silver ore for a while came out of this one um, mountain. Um, Athlupa will be captured. He will, I told you the story in class, he will say, if you release me, I'll fill this room over, you know, once with gold and twice over with silver. Pizarro says, go for it. And then he kills him anyway and it leads to the destruction of the great Incan um, uh, empire. And so Cusco is captured without a really, really, really big struggle. All right, guys, that is your review on Incas, Aztecs, um, and Mayas. Tomorrow we'll probably do look the Mongol Empire and possibly move into the spread of um, Islam, the gunpowder empires worldwide.